channels, probably not a lot of videos that start with a picture of my butt uh, coming into the engine room, but I just wanted to show you how easy it is to get in here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm behind the engine. I didn't have to climb over it. And actually behind me back here, I can point so you can see, is the water heater. So I can just sit down on that and I have complete access to the port side of the engine. Uh, all of this stuff here, um, refrigeration, the generator, and the stuff behind me. And then if, um, if I want to uh, access the other side of the engine, of course, it's wide open through the doors. So most about what you're about to see will be shot sitting right where I am now. So you have some perspective. And I'm just going to take you through the engine room. I know it looks intimidating, but what you see here is actually no more than would be on a 45-foot boat, a simple 45-foot boat, um, except maybe the generator. But it's spread out so you can see it and work on it. And I can tell you, having uh, worked on a bunch of boats in my life, that in, when you have something to fix or install, access is about half the job. And on this boat, access is easy. It's all right in front of you. And the other, other advantage is you see things before they go badly wrong. You see them when they start to go slightly wrong. Maybe a leak or something in an engine hose. You don't see that when an engine's crammed under the cockpit. Well, we're now looking to port, and uh, that's the isolation transformer on the right-hand side of a corner. And on the left, there's what's called a soft starter, and with a switch next to it, that's for Europe. Uh, if you're in Europe and you use an isolation transformer because of the high inrush current at 220 volts, you'll pop the dock breaker almost every time. So, uh, if you, particularly if you're set up North American-wise. So that uh, there solves that problem. Um, it's a, a Mastervolt product. And then in the gray box on the lower right it are uh, junction boxes uh, or taps. So you can change the taps on the transformer uh, for 220. So when you're in Europe, you can change to 220 and uh, still have 110 on the boat. Of course, it's still uh, uh, 50 cycles, so anything with a motor in it can be a problem, but it's fine for charging the batteries and all kinds of other things. And that's the main one is charging the batteries because this is primarily a 12 volt boat anyway. Uh, so, and we also have a full set of adapter plugs, adapter cords that adapt the North American 30 amp uh, to all of the uh, things you'll find on the wharves in uh, in Europe and other 220 volt uh, countries. Up here we can see two pumps. Uh, the upper one is the gray water pump and the bottom one is one of the bilge pumps. I'm still behind the generator here on the port side and I built this uh, wooden construction here uh, some years ago. It was a toolbox behind, uh, there's a spare propeller there fixed propeller in case the uh, you're up north or somewhere in a remote place and the um, uh, max prop uh, sheds a blade or something, never has, but uh, we like to have a spare prop. Um, and then in front, uh, down in here, there are four of these red toolboxes and they, they have parts and uh, all kinds of bits and pieces. There's a plumbing one and a deck one and Etc. And this is just some of the stuff we have aboard. There's also a ton of spares under the uh, the berth in the aft cabin, which we're going to see later, and uh, in a later video. And uh, there's also full inventory. So if you're trying to find something, it's uh, it's easy to find. So there we are. I've taken out one of the red boxes, and as you can see, we actually go in underneath the top toolkit. And that's where we keep really heavy tools that would be dangerous in a knockdown or something. They're really well constrained back there. This webbing goes over the red toolboxes and it gets tied around the handles so they can't possibly fly out. And uh, down there we have a prop puller. There's no point in having a spare prop if you can't get the, uh, get the old prop off. Um, you won't find a prop puller on the east coast of Greenland. And uh, there's a set of hydraulic cutters there because we have rod rigging, so uh, ordinary bolt cutters are not gonna make it. The uh, freezer, fridge and freezer are the other side of this. 
very well insulated, um, so there's no problem with heat from the engine room. But it means it's easy to uh, uh, to plumb in the refrigeration system. So there's the compressor, the heat exchanger, that's the pump, and uh, you can see behind it the water filter, um, raw water filter for the pump, the uh, dryer, the reservoir here, all of that stuff all built in. Also, we have a spare compressor for it and a spare motor. And that's another point. It's a holding plate system, and many holding plate systems are belted on the engine. That's a really bad idea. We have a big alternator on the engine, make a pile of current, and then we drive this big half horsepower Leeson motor, and that then drives the compressor. So we're not subjecting the compressor to a bunch of vibration, and we're not junking up the front of the engine either. So, All right, I'm now standing on the starboard side of the engine by the entrance to the engine room. I'll just take you through a few of the, these things here. That's the generator. It's a five kilowatt Northern Lights uh, lugger, a commercial quality generator. I've been amazing. It's only got, I don't know, about 3,000 hours on it. These typically go 15,000 hours between rebuilds. And the only thing that has ever failed on it is we had one sensor go bad. Other than that, it's been 100% reliable. Um, the difference between these uh, constant um, RPMs, uh, 1800 RPM generators, and the um, less uh, robust recreational ones like is just amazing. A uh, huge Seagull activated charcoal filter, and uh, it filters all the water in the boat from the tank. So if you do by any chance pick up some bad water, uh, this filters pretty much anything out, including bacteria. We'll even take Giardia. The wiring for the engine harnesses and uh, the voltage regulators. You can see the voltage regulator right there uh, for the alternator. And then there's one of our three 40 amp chargers. And you need a bunch of chargers because uh, if you have a AC generator, Obviously, you don't want to be running it for hours to try and charge the batteries because you can't charge them fast enough. And then the gray box down at the bottom there is the refrigeration controls. So people will look at this and say, wow, that's complicated. But in fact, it's just exactly the same as you would have in pretty much any boat. Uh, the difference is that you can see it and it just makes it way easier to operate and, and get to. And while we're uh, talking about wiring and ease of uh, getting to it that's the uh, just as you come into the engine room aft and it's all the uh, 12 volt uh, high current wiring uh, two master switches uh, one's the house and the house battery's broken in one two both so it's uh, the house bank is in two banks and then there's a separate engine start battery which is controlled by the other switch and again really easy to work on the neutral bus up there Positive bus there. You can see everything's fused. Batteries are fused. JBYC specs. Uh, there's a gang solenoid, uh, which automatically gangs the um, the battery when we're charging uh, the engine battery, so it charges. There's another gang solenoid. Solenoid never used it, but there's a switch at the binnacle, and if the engine start battery was incapable of turning the engine over, you just pull that switch up, and that solenoid uh, gangs the house battery in with into the starter so, mode. I always laugh when I see wooden plugs tied to the seacock. I mean, that's the standard, I know, but think about it for a moment. You've got a problem with a two, that's a two inch seacock. And so you've got a fountain probably 10 feet high, or it would be if it wasn't spraying you in the face. And you got to go down there and get the wooden plug to solve the problem. Uh, not a good idea. So we put them up there, and then we also have some in a locker, um, which is uh, where everybody knows where they are. This uh, is a crash pump, and I put a lot of thought into crash pumps. I don't like belting stuff off the engine, um, because obviously that's dependent on the engine running. So this is actually a, a 110 volt, uh, very 100% duty cycle uh, pump. And uh, it spits water. I, we can look, I'll, I'll link to it, but it's on the site, this full spec of it, and why we chose it as a crash pump. It's portable, and that's intentional too. So you can just dump the whole thing down in the bilge and let it go. And I've tried it on a couple of things, and it just, it, uh, we've never had to use it in anger, but boy, does it move water. 
and it can do it hour after hour. It has creational ones. They'll just uh, burn out if you try and run them for a long period. These are blowers. Uh, we've got the engine uh, room positively ventilated. Put a lot of work into that. It wasn't wonderful. You can see it. Just see one of the vent blows there. That's the uh, that's blowing in, and then up on the engine room roof, there is one that's sucking. And we've got them balanced out. They go out through derades, so they're safe from flooding. And we've got them balanced out so that the engine room, allowing for the amount of air that the engine itself is using, is just just a little negative pressure. So you're not um, you know you're not uh, blowing a lot of heat into the boat. You don't want the engine room to be positive pressure because you end up blowing heat and fumes and everything else into the boat. This uh, this little Y fitting here, a blower over the stove in the galley extractor. And that's really nice to have because one of the byproducts of propane when you burn it is water vapor. That's a lot of reasons that a lot of yachts is, are so damp. This is the brand new engine room fire suppression system that I put in uh, this spring and it's uh, fully ABYC compliant, and it's one of the new, um, not so uh, environmentally hazardous um, uh, fire suppression agents, but it's not going to hurt the engine or anything. Um, and it has both a manual pull cable, you can see that. This was actually done uh, with advice from a full-on commercial um, fire suppression company. And uh, you can see little details that they, they specified, like the manual pull cable is covered with a fireproof shield. Not a lot of uh, help if the pull cable itself melts, is it? And there's also a uh, sensor, and that all goes to a control box outside the engine room, um, which I'll talk about on, on the chart table. It's, a... it's right where it needs to be right above the main engine fuel injection area. One of the other things I learned is that uh, diesel does burn, and when they have a bad fire, it is almost invariably because something went wrong in the fuel injection system, an injector pipe or something like that, and then that atomized diesel uh, ignited. And uh, the stories they told me about what happens then and how much gas you need to... Uh, to suppress it um, were sobering indeed. They specified this bottle, it's huge, and much bigger than the old one. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to make sure they could flood the entire engine room, uh, which is quite large, and the adjacent bilge. Uh, because if you can't flood the adjacent bilge with uh, fire suppression, then you lose the fire suppression in the main engine room and you get a flashback. Looking at the forward um, engine room bulkhead, um, so under the companionway, if you can imagine, this is this bulkhead is actually a soft patch. Uh, the last time we repowered, I think it took me about a day and a half to get all of this out, get the front bulkhead out, and then you get perfect access to the front of the engine through the companionway, and you just drop a, a boom truck hook uh, down, uh, pick up one, this uh, mount here and one here, and then you just uh, use a chain fall on the back of the engine to from the engine room roof. That's another nice thing, by the way, is the engine room roof, this being an aluminum boat, is plenty strong enough to lift the whole engine off the beds using, uh, in fact, I even carry a, a chain fall and a, a clamp that goes around this here. This is the fuel management system. Again, it kind of looks, uh, complicated but it really isn't the key is that you can actually see everything that is in most any boat so these are all the valves to select so we've got the fuel system separated for the engine the generator and the polish and uh, so you don't want to do what you see on some boats where they plumb um, the engine and the generator to the same manifold that's asking for air leak problems um, and then, so going um, from port to starboard here, that's the uh, that's the fuel polish system, and it uses this little pump here, 40 gallon per hour pump, to circulate the fuel. You can circulate the fuel one tank. Um, you can pump fuel from one tank to another tank, um, 
and you can also um, you can flip up here and you can pump crap out of the bottom of the tank i've never had to do that but you can do it if you got water in your fuel or something like that so if the lift pump on the main engine was to quit it's an electric lift pump uh you can you can flip that to pressure and uh pressurize um, the fuel uh using the polish pump and you're back up back in business by the way you'll notice there's a lot of um stuff in the base of the polish filter as you would expect Whenever we're uh, anywhere with the boats rolling around offshore, we run the polish filter, and I don't bother to clean it out down there that often. I do it once a year, and it's uh, we're at the end of the year now, so that's why it's a bit grubby. But you'll see that the bowls on the generator and the main engine are perfectly clean. And because we polish the fuel so much, although I change the fuel filters, uh, primary filters on both every year, uh, I always feel like kind of a fool doing it because they're almost always clean. That little timer there runs the polish system, so you can set it to run for a while. And just down here, so you get a sense, that's the fuel tanks, port and starboard fuel tanks. And uh, those are the inspection hatches. We'll talk more about those hatches uh, when we get to the salon area. Just gives you an idea of the things we've done plumbing-wise. Um, those are uh, two four-spar Marillon um, roll water filters, bottom one's the main engine, top one's the generator. And in fact, as per ABY spec, which you very rarely see honored, um, they are both above the water line. This is a bronze Groco Seacock, two, two inch for the cockpit uh, drain. And uh, somebody is sure to have a meltdown now and say, oh no, bronze Seacock, an aluminum boat, boat's gonna fall apart. Uh, no. Uh, it's not the way it works. You have to understand that for um, stray current corrosion to get going, you have to have a circuit. Um, it's not enough just to have the two different materials immersed in the same water column. Um, I explain a lot more of this and I'll link to that. But as you can see, the seacock is isolated from the hull. You'll notice under the seacock, there is absolutely no corrosion. And... Uh, no pitting, nothing. Um, I think a lot of the stories about aluminum boats get going because people blame things like this and what the actual problem was, was stray current corrosion. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the, uh, when we're at the chart, ta uh, chart tables and we look at the meta that checks for that. We just had the boat surveyed uh, by a, not just an ordinary surveyor, but by a marine engineer who designs and builds metal boats. And uh, he, um, he said that basically he could find no signs of any corrosion um, at all on the, on the hull. And that's the nice thing about aluminum, by the way, too, is that if you can get access to the bilge where we can, um, corrosion either is there or isn't. You can see it. The paint on the hull is all flaking. People get, see that and get very worked up and say, ah, oh, it should all be coated to protect the aluminum. This is false. Uh, there is absolutely no reason for coating aluminum. The builder of this boat didn't make many mistakes, but he did make one doozy, and that was he painted the bilges. So I've spent the last 30 years, every time I clean the bilges, which I do annually, scraping off loose paint. And so tip for you, if you think you're buying an aluminum boat, do not paint the bilges. You will never get the paint to stick, and you will hate yourself. Um, it doesn't do any harm. And talking of bilge pumps, we'll see the big one um, that this uh, this PVC pipe uh, feeds when we get in the aft cabin. But uh, one of the things that's kind of cool about this boat is, is a lot of uh, uh, the plumbing that's done with PVC pipe, either uh, Schedule 40, which is this stuff, um, which is great, and uh, or Schedule 80 hot water pipe, which is uh, this stuff here for the fresh water system. This is way better than any of the click together marine systems, uh, much more robust. And you can put something together with PVC pipe in, a, in just uh, no time at all. I built this manifold here, um, which, allow, which helps um, with winterizing the water heater. It means you can bypass the water heater out so you can drain it. 
So talking of uh, winterizing, we've got all kinds of little gadgets that help for that. And uh, for example, these two um, valves drain the lowest point in the exhaust system, which I'll tell you about in a minute. And that one drains the um, lift box. And the other benefit of that one is that if it's never happened, but if you had trouble starting the engine and you turned it over a bunch, of course, you're pumping water into the, into the lift boxes. Uh, people have actually flooded engines that way. So what you can do if you get concerned is just open that valve. Okay, let's uh, talk about the main engine. This has been really important to us over the years in the Arctic. Uh, uh, is very often either no wind at all or way more than you want to be playing with. And so you do end up steaming a lot. And uh, so the great thing about this boat, although she's a wonderful sailboat, won a class twice in the Bermuda race, uh, she's also a great motorboat. Uh, and this engine's part of the secret. This is actually the third engine in the boat. Uh, we uh, put it in in 2010, uh, 87 horsepower. Um, and it's a, uh, we went to a lot of trouble to select this engine. It's a low revving engine, 2400 RPM, which makes it far more efficient and more reliable. And uh, this is the kind of engine that Perkins sell this block to, you know, run pumps in remote places and generators in remote places um, where they just start it, run it full load uh, for the rest of its life. And talking about the rest of its life, uh, on the plaque, it actually says expected life 10,000 hours. Not a lot of engine manufacturers that do that kind of thing. So it's just a good basic engine um, with a me mechanical fuel pump. There's no computer on it. Uh, all you need to do is get fuel and air to it, and uh, it'll run. And uh, right now we've got, uh, I don't know, coming up... Uh, Coming up two and a half thousand hours on it, I guess, and it's been uh, it's just been great. Transmission is a ZF45, which is oversized for the boat and for the horsepower of the engine. Again, intentionally, we try to oversize everything, and it drives a constant velocity joint from AquaDrive, which you can see there, and then that it, the shaft itself draw, pushes into a thrust bearing. Um, that is on this uh, thrust plate, which is welded, or the flange it's on is welded into the hull. The thrust, thrust plate itself, we upgraded last year. One of the few times I've ever let anybody else do something unsupervised was putting this in originally in 2010, and the boatyard made an absolute bloody mess of it. They did it, they did it completely wrong. And uh, I had trusted them because I'd worked with them once uh, several times before. I don't know whether they're having a bad day or what the hell went wrong. So and last year, I redid the whole thing myself under the supervision of a marine, commercial marine engineer and naval architect who did all the calculations. And we upsized the thrust plate, as you see. That's one inch thick aluminum. And then there's a, a stiffening bar bolted across there and that that absorbs all the thrust from the shaft so it's not pushing on the engine and then if you can just see down there there's a thrust bearing bolted to that the result of doing all this work is how smooth the engine is now it's just amazing even at full throttle there's just no vibration you can put your hand on the binnacle or remember this is a metal boat and you just can't feel anything and then back off there there's a uh, a um, dripless seal um, and uh, of course I redid all that while I was back there um, the shaft is also um, Aquamet or one of those is four years old the one we had in there got scored by a defective cutlass bearing who knew um, so we just replaced it and probably we could have uh, uh, filled up the score with weld or companies will do that for you and polish it but uh, we don't do things that way on this boat because of the kind of places we, we've always visited. Steering gear is nice and simple. But There's a chain coming down from the binnacle there. And uh, you can see these this big jack shaft here that um, has in these uh, industrial bearings. Big chain coming down there, stainless steel chain. That comes back here to a stainless steel chain on the same jack shaft. And then that goes to the cables. 
and they run aft to the uh, rudder shaft on these uh, custom uh, sheaves, which are uh, bo uh, which are in uh, sh cheeks that are welded to the hull all the way along, and they have uh, bonds bushings bearings. Uh, they've been they've been great. There's no wear in them after all these years, and as you can see, they have Zerk fittings to uh, lubricate them. Everything does. And the steering is, you have to uh, you have to try it to appreciate it, how smooth it is and how little resistance there is, particularly for a center of a cockpit boat where we're driving all the way back there. It's, it's quite extraordinary. I was talking about how smooth the engine is and how I redid everything. I also put new mounts on while I was about it. And um, you can see if I'm moving the engine intentionally here just with a hand, these are very soft mounts and they're provided by AquaDrive and engineered by AquaDrive in, in Germany when you uh, send them the specifications. And so you can have soft mounts which uh, stop any vibration going into the boat uh, because you're not, not uh, absorbing the thrust from the uh, shaft uh, that's being taken by that thrust plate we showed you. The orange stuff underneath is what's called chalk fast. And I realigned the engine absolutely dead nuts perfect on that stuff um, last year. And this is what the commercial guys use to align big ship engines. I mean, they, they align engines in super tankers with this stuff. And it's just so much better than messing with the silly shims and everything you see in the recreational world. Before we leave the engine, let's talk about the exhaust system a bit. Exhaust systems can be a real problem in center cockpit boats, because if you try and pump the water all the way out um, the stern, you get too much back pressure. And if you take it out the side of the boat, as you often see, you always have a flood risk, uh, flooding the engine risk when the boat's healed. Um, so there's a better solution, and we put this in when we put this engine in. Like the generator, we've uh, dry stacked um, the, uh, the exhaust as it comes out of the engine. And you can see that there. Um, so that's dry, and that is well above the water line. I think, uh, sorry, I remember 18 inches above the water line before we inject the water. So even, for example, if a siphon brake fa uh, failed, um, you're not gonna flood the engine because you can't siphon uphill, um, which was what you'd be trying to do. And then we, uh, so we mix in water right there in the elbow. The elbow's covered with, uh, with this uh, nice material. I got this custom built by a guy out in uh, BC who does uh, dry stack covers and it's just really a nice piece of kit. Water is injected and it comes into this lift muffler. It'd be pretty standard on, on most boats. It then comes up here to a water separator. This is a system from Halley and Marine in England who really do these well. They fully designed it for this boat, custom design. And uh, the water is then taken out there and goes down through this no return valve. We do everything we can to reduce the chances of any flooding to zero, and I, we've never had any trouble. And that goes out of seacock in the bottom of the boat. You can probably just see there. And then the uh, now cool but dry exhaust goes out the stern of the boat. Um, so there's no back pressure because you're not trying to pump water out there. The engine has a single powerful 12 volt alternator on it. I think it's 160 amps and it's a twin half inch belt, so you can take that power off. We built this nice little gadget here to tension the alternator. I'm not a believer in putting two alternators on engines. I know people do that, uh, but it's just junking up the engine. And